This is absolutely the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hello and welcome to the worship of God with the First Presbyterian Church here in South St. Paul, Minnesota on this fourth Sunday in the Easter season or Earth Sunday. Tomorrow is uh, Earth, Earth Day, and so the Sunday before we celebrate uh, our own uh, gift of God's creation and give thanks and praise for all that God has provided to us. Uh, whether you are, it's good to have you here in the sanctuary worshiping with us. If you're worshiping with us uh, uh, by live stream or watching us later in the week, I don't know quite how it works, but the Holy Spirit brings us together from different places and at different times, and together we are the church worshiping God together, and for that we are truly grateful. Uh, a reminder, as if you need one, we are in the midst of our stewardship uh, campaign, and so we've already received a, a, a number of pledge cards from all of you. Uh, some who have uh, dropped their card in the offering plate, others of you who've done it electronically through the website. And so just a reminder to you of all the different ways that you can uh, get your pledge to us for the coming fiscal year 24-25. Uh, there's pledge cards right now that are out on the kiosk. Uh, you can go to the website and electronically pledge. You can just uh, uh, send an email to finance at fpcssp.org in our financial Secretary Phyllis Hahn uh, will get your pledges that way. And even if you're not a member, if you've never had the pleasure of sitting in a session meeting and have them vote on you as to your worthiness as a member, um, <laughs> but you consider yourself a member of this congregation, that this is where you belong, please know that you are welcome to uh, pledge to the ministry and mission of this congregation out of gratitude for what you uh, receive here. Uh, and that goes for those who are watching on the live stream as well from all places around the country and actually around the world who are watching. Or if you would just like to give a one-time financial gift uh, to show your support and gratitude, of course, we would greatly appreciate that and welcome it. There are a number of announcements in your bulletin that I would ask you to take note of. And again, if you uh, do not receive our Wednesday email, which is full of all sorts of information about what's going on in our congregation uh, and would like to receive that, please let the uh, church office know that you'd like to be put on that list. And that will keep you up to date along with the bulletin and the church newsletter as to everything that's going on and to find ways for you to participate and support, again, the mission and ministries of this congregation. With no other announcements, let us begin our time of worship with a moment of centering silence. I apologize, I got a little carried away there. Uh, and before we call ourselves to worship, I would invite the chair of the Social Justice in Action Committee, Ruth Kruger, to come forward to remind us and tell us about our mission of the month here in April, the one great hour of sharing denominational offering. Good morning. One of the things that attracted me to this particular church, Presbyterians in general, but this particular church is the focus on mission and an active hands-on and financial commitment to mission. So you all are aware we have a mission of the month each month. 
but it's taken me a while. I was never an adult. I grew up a Presbyterian, but I spent uh, my beginning adult years as a Lutheran. So I had to figure out how PCUSA actually works. It has four general fundraisers during the course of the year. And the big one for missions is the one great hour of sharing. In the same way that we're looking more to a unified budget, that's what the PCUSA does. It invites all the churches in the United States to contribute to the mission drive. And they call it the one great hour of sharing. So we have incorporated those four drives into our mission of the month. And the one here in the spring is the um, <clears throat> one great hour of sharing. The, we send it for hunger programs to promote self-development, to help people, teach them to fish, in other words. You've all heard that. And then does Presbyterian disaster assistance. I think we're all really proud when we see when a disaster and we can spot those shirts that the disaster assistance Presbyterians wear, they're often there before anybody else, certainly before FEMA lots of times. So this is your opportunity. We've had big drives over the last few years for the Ukraine, for Puerto Rico. We're going to focus all that now in the April mission of the month so give generously to the one great hour of sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And now let us call ourselves to worship. O oh, divine voice, you sing and the universe comes into being. O oh, divine breath, you breathe and all things spring to life. O oh, divine word, you call and creation is sustained. O oh, divine flesh, you are born among us and the creator is clothed in creation. O oh, divine spirit, you fill all that has been formed. O oh, divine life, you are the pulse of all that is. Please stand as you are able in body or in spirit for our opening hymn number 591, Halle Hallelujah.
tell ourselves that we have no need of God's mercy, that there's nothing that we need to be forgiven for and nothing we need to forgive others for, we are lying to ourselves. But if we come before God and one another, sharing where we have strayed from the way of abundant life and infinite love that has been revealed to us in Jesus, God hears our prayers and offers us another chance, a new day, and a new life. Please join me in our prayer for forgiveness. Creator God, we have erred. We have caused the extinction of species, of cultures, of language, and turned our backs to your goodness and each other. We continue to err, ignoring those who hold wisdom about our earth, pushing them to fragile places and infertile lands, sacrificing sustainability for comfort and the future for today. We assume that everything will adapt, that nature will right itself, that we don't have to change. In our fear, help us find courage to grow in understanding of ourselves, each other, and our blessed earth. In our mistakes, help us find wisdom to change our ways and make things right. In our guilt and shame, help us find freedom to live simply, speak bravely, and act justly. In your holy name we pray, amen. And now receive the assurance of God's healing, transforming grace. Spirit of God, we rejoice that you move within us and enrich our prayer. By your love, we find healing for our hurt, and we are called to bring healing to your creation. By your grace and love, we are forgiven and made new. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to children's time. Can I invite all the kids on up to the steps with me this morning? Well, there's a bunch of you today. This should be fun. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. What is tomorrow? Earth Day. It's Earth Day. And what do we do on Earth Day? What's the point of Earth Day? What do people do on Earth Day? Oh, crickets. Oh, sustainability. Maybe we help take care of the earth. A lot of people go out in their communities and they do community cleanup days and they maybe mow their lawn or get ready for gardening, all sorts of different things outdoors. So I thought it would be fun uh, to maybe name some parts of creation, of nature. Can you name anything, like the outdoors? Tree, okay, a tree. The grass. Water, is that water? What else? Flowers. Animals, what's y'all's favorite animal? 
A penguin? An albatross. Ooh, I like that. I like that. <laughs> Waterfalls? Is that it? Is that, are we done naming stuff? Well, y'all forgot the most important one. Y'all forgot the most important one? You! We're part of creation, right? God created us, right? When, when they were making creation, we were included in that, right? And so tomorrow, I want you all to remember that you are a part, a big part of God's creation. Then we should take care of ourselves and each other, too, on Earth Day. After all, you are the only you we have on the whole Earth. So it's important to take care of ourselves, right? And so tomorrow, I really want you to also take time to do something nice for yourself. Does that sound like a good plan? All right, cool. Will you all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your creation. Thank you for your creation. Thank you for us. Thank you for us. And help us to care for the earth. And help us to care for the earth. As much as you care for us. As much as you care for us. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right, y'all can go back to your seats. <laughs> Will you please join me with the prayer? for illumination as printed in your bulletin. You are the living God who sustains all life in continually unfolding ways. And now may we open our ears to your continually unfolding word. You speak to us in new and vital ways. With all the power you have given us, let us be silent that we may be nourished and comforted, challenged and provided new focus. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out, brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And all who came before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The story of God's people. Thanks be to God. Initially, we were going to start our lives as husband and wife living in Burnsville. I actually do wonder now and then how my life might have unfolded differently had we stuck to that original plan. We both had experience living in the suburbs. In fact, we were both living in the suburbs before we got married during our engagement. But when the opportunity came along to live in the city, the city of Minneapolis, we changed our plans and moved into our one bedroom apartment on the corner of 21st and Aldrich Avenue. If you've ever driven past the Wedge Co-op on Lindale, we were just one block west. Lisa's youngest brother, Rich, stayed with us for a while that year and slept on the Murphy bed in our, I suppose you would call it living room, you know, the beds that fold up into the wall. There's a speedway on the corner back then, Super America, and he would have difficulty sleeping, what with the 
Go ahead, pump five, pump five, go ahead, <laughs> all night long. It was a great first apartment, but then we got cats. The next fall, after moving in, we were at a retreat for youth leaders up at Clearwater Forest, the same retreat where we first met our good friend Katie Estes 34 years ago. And there was a litter of kittens who were looking for new homes. Despite our apartment not allowing cats, we agreed to take one. Later that night, Lisa was talking with someone who convinced her, and then she convinced me that we should really take two cats so they would have each other for company. As far as the no pets allowed rule, if we were going to break it with one cat, then why not two? So we picked out two sisters, Maggie and Allison. They grew old together, almost 20 years, and never weighed more than eight pounds and six pounds, respectively. They were wonderful, amazing, very small cats who caused us to have to find a new place to live. We found a fourplex not that far away on the corner of Fremont Avenue and Lake Street, a block or two away from Calhoun Square. It was a great place to live, and we had fantastic neighbors. When we were all snowed in during the Halloween blizzard in 1991, someone walked across the street to the video store, and I think another person walked to the liquor store, and then we just gathered together in one of the apartments and watched old movies. I remember The Bad Seed and Rebecca for sure. And we made meals for each other until the really nice drug dealers next door shoveled everybody out. It was also a great place to live, but maybe not to raise your newborn daughter. When we moved away to Dubuque, Iowa to go to seminary, it was so quiet I could hardly get to sleep at night. Eventually, we found our way back here, and after living in a church manse in Roseville for a few years, bought our first and only house in the north end of St. Paul. We are city people. We are St. Paul people. We know all the shortcuts, Aid Mill and Pierce Butler, as well as the five and seven way intersections that help keep people from Minneapolis and the suburbs out, or at <laughs> least from staying very long or coming back too soon. All this is a very long, descriptive way of saying, I know nothing about sheep or shepherding, or animal husbandry, or farming of just about any kind. Shocking, I know. I mean, I have lived in Minnesota the overwhelming majority of my life, so I know a few things. I know the difference between sweet corn and feed corn, for example. It just sort of happens, whether you want it to or not. The same is true of hockey. You may have never attended a game yourself, but you might know that there are three periods and that you can't cross the blue line before the puck does. It just happens when you live in Minnesota. These things somehow seep into our upper Midwest subconsciousness, bidden or not. But no matter how many flannel shirts and Carhartt pants I own, when I walk through the barns at the state fair, I will never be mistaken for someone who actually knows how to milk a cow or care for a pig or, in today's scripture passage, a sheep. Maybe in first century Palestine up north in the Galilean area, stories and analogies around agriculture made sense to the people to whom Jesus was preaching and teaching. But to this city preacher in the 21st century, any specific particularities to that time and place or any subtle and nuanced meanings, idioms, or plays on word are thoroughly lost on me. Even the most basic elements of the story send me to Google for insight and information. For instance, I had to look up what a sheepfold is, and not just any sheepfold, but one that would have been familiar to Jesus' audience. In ancient Palestine, Jewish shepherds brought their flocks back to the sheepfold for protection after a day of grazing. Predators, such as wolves and other animals, sought to eat the sheep, and they were particularly active at night. But they could not penetrate the sheepfold, 
which was a walled structure topped with briars to keep out those who wanted to destroy the sheep. It had but one entrance, its gate, and many shepherds would share the same sheepfold. Thus sheep might get separated from their flocks in the sheepfold, but in the morning when the shepherd called, everything got sorted out for every sheep knew the voice of its shepherd. Wait a second. Many shepherds would share the same sheepfold? That's kind of interesting to me. So the sheepfolds didn't just include one shepherd's flock of sheep, but many. There weren't separate sheepfolds for each flock and each shepherd, each one built to outdo the sheepfold of the next shepherd with really high walls, a good band, and a Starbucks to built to protect the purity and identity of their sheep and keep them from talking, listening, learning from any of the more progressive sheep in their flocks. No, in fact, the sheepfold was apparently a safe enough space, safe in the broadest of terms, that different sheep from different flocks with different shepherds would get separated and just intermingle with one another. As analogies go, I thought that was an intriguing piece of information. Now, it doesn't change the fact that all of these different sheep from different flocks with different shepherds still must enter the sheepfold through the one and only gate. And in this morning's story, that gate is Jesus. He can't be any clearer than the four words, I am the gate, followed by the troublesome, at least for me, Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. No surprise here that the easiest interpretation and thus the most common is that the only way to enter the kingdom of God and receive eternal life is by the way of the one true gate who is Jesus. All other ways of entering the sheepfold are not only invalid, but are thieves who come to steal and kill and destroy. So much for interfaith dialogue or even ecumenical Christian dialogue, thieves who come to steal and kill and destroy. However, you know what the passage doesn't say? Oftentimes more enlightening than what it does or perhaps is intentionally overlooked, it doesn't say anything about any sheep being excluded at the gate from entering being asked to prove their worthiness, whether they believe the correct things. All are welcome, just as they are. And it doesn't say anything about the sheep being miraculously transformed into one pure flock. They maintain their diversity, their different flocks and their different shepherds. The gate doesn't demand conformity and homogeneity. The gate provides a safe space for difference and diversity. And in the morning, they each go out to pasture as their own different flocks, listening to the voice of their different shepherds. This heading back out to pasture in the morning is the other part of the gate analogy, Jesus is the gate, that I find astonishing. Or at least I was astonished not to have noticed it before and deserving of a closer look questions and conversation. Perhaps we get told enough what these passages mean that we just take those meanings for granted, that the entire passage is about how only those who enter by the gate will be saved. However, again, I may have never milked a cow, but I'm pretty sure gates swing both ways, or at least they are for both entering and leaving by. So how do we make sense of the sheep, different sheep, different flocks, exiting the sheepfold through the gate, Jesus, as well? And at least in this analogy, how Jesus isn't even the shepherd. That will come later. But that he is the gate, the way from safety and security of the sheepfold to the beauty and freedom, danger and vulnerability of the pasture life, abundant, where the shepherd leads them out, goes ahead and calls to them, calls to their sheep to follow them. 
So why has Christianity, the church, chosen for centuries, millennia, to interpret this story as Jesus being the only way to salvation to enter the kingdom of God and not Jesus as the way out of the sheepfold and into the world, into the pastures of abundant life? I don't have an answer, but I think it's a good question and worth more contemplation and discernment. Maybe because it naturally leads to the even bigger question, which is, if the Bible, and so for the most part Christianity, is full of contradictions and open to different interpretations, why would one, the church, any individual Christian, intentionally choose those interpretations that promote judgment and shame and exclusion and division and hostility and hatred and injustice? Why wouldn't one, the church, any individual Christian, instead choose those interpretations that lead to compassion and kindness, creativity and generosity, inclusion and justice, forgiveness and healing, hope and peace and joy and love, life, and to have that life abundantly? Why would we choose one over the other? Why would we choose a destructive interpretation over a constructive interpretation. <clears throat> Chew on that one on the way home. For this morning's thought, let's just focus on Jesus being the gate as the way out, the way out of the safety and security of the sheepfold and into the world of freedom and ab abundance, but also vulnerability and danger from thieves and predators. Because remember, for them to try and get inside the sheepfold, they must be outside the walls of the sheepfold. Friends, we are called to leave the sanctuary of this place and go out into the world by the way of infinite love and abundant life that has been revealed to us through Jesus, the gate, to follow the shepherd who leads us out who goes before us, ahead of us, calling to us. The third category that describes who we are and who we want to be in this congregation for the stewardship campaign is serving. The first two being worship and learning. Last week, I took a few statements off of our website, fpcssp.org, and I thought I would again today. First Presbyterian in South St. Paul is a family of faith always learning. We believe questioning is part of growing in faith. We strive to actively follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. We believe our faith should not simply be talked about, but lived out through our actions. We welcome all people just as they are. We strive to actively follow the teachings of Jesus, the gate of welcome and inclusion and diversity, as well as the gate to compassion and justice and service. We believe our faith should not simply be talked about, but lived out through action, lived out beyond the walls of the sheepfold into a world full of dangers, toils, and snares, that all might have life and to have that life abundantly. The website goes on to say that we are a community focused on spreading God's love in our community and the world. We are pledged to actively oppose injustices toward any person or group locally, nationally, and globally. Our work addresses poverty, hunger, homelessness, and environmental justice. We strive to remove barriers to equal justice and opportunity in our society to support community involvement and legislation to affect social justice goals and to promote educational opportunities that encourage critical thinking while providing resources for research and fact checking. Our goals are to promote social justice for all of God's children, to affirm that BIPOC lives matter, black, indigenous, and people of color, 
to support LGBTQIA plus people locally and via the More Light movement, promote environmental stewardship and to be an earth care congregation and to serve others. This is who we are, or more, more accurately, this is who we say we are, who we strive to become. And I, for one, am so proud to belong to this community, this family of faith, and all of our efforts to follow the way of abundant life and the divine voice of infinite love. We come together in this place, this sanctuary, just as we are, sharing our different gifts and different experiences, free from shame and judgment. And then we go back out into the world through the same door, through the same gate by which we entered, loving and serving one another, caring for those most vulnerable to the thieves and bandits, the injustices and violence, the cruelty and fear that all God's beloved children, all God's beloved sheep might have the same privileges and opportunities, the same freedoms and access to fundamental resources that all of us, all of us would have life and to have that life abundantly. And to God alone be all the glory. Amen. Happy Earth Day. 
In 2011, um, the session signed the Earth Care Pledge, acknowledging that Earth and all creation is God's, that God calls us all to be careful, humble stewards of this earth and to protect and restore it for its own sake and for the future use and enjoyment of the human family. The session also agreed to take specific actions in four areas, worship, outreach, education, and facilities. So after the session signed the pledge, the Earth Care Committee got busy and looked at those four areas and counted points to see if we qualified to be an Earth Care congregation. And to nobody's surprise, we did, because we've always been an Earth Care congregation. Um, uh, so after we counted, um, we filed the paperwork, and we became the second or the third Earth Care congregation in Minnesota. Something to be proud of. After that, um, the work kind of went back to the committees. The Earth Care Committee dissolved, and it was business as usual. So the, um, we created the community garden, which um, rents plots and has the master gardener's seed trial. We replaced old efficient lighting with LEDs. So these are gorgeous lights. They used to kind of glow yellow and not be matching. So improvement on two ways. Um, improve the efficiency of the heating and cooling system. Signed up for wind generated renewable energy for electricity, worked with neighbors to create a gorgeous pollinator garden on that side of the, the property, um, beefed up recycling and added organic recycling. Um, and then some of the members are working with people at Clearwater Forest to eradicate the invasives that are mo moving into that gorgeous forest. As part of the food shelf, um, we had a farmer's market um, to raise money, I'm mean, not as, as part of the garden, we had a food shelf, and we donated a lot of food and money to neighbor's food shelf, and the master gardeners continue to do that, so we've donated over 12,000 pounds of fresh vegetables. Um, in, in that 12 years, business has kind of gone on, but it's time to reform the Earth Care Committee. So right now we have four people anxious to do it, and what we're gonna look at is just tweaking things we already have and then look at new opportunities that kind of suit the church, and then we need to find committees that'll do it. Um, so if any of you are interested in being on that committee, uh, let me know, because we're ready to go. Um, I wanted to say two more things, that the work of the Earth Care Committee and, and all the Earth Care things stand on the shoulders of giants. And um, Ed Nelson, Ruth Nelson, and Rex won't be able to be on the committee the second time around, but we will miss them. And the other thing is that Paul and I we're so thankful to find this church that cared about creation. A lot of Presbyterian churches focus on other things, but this one is really special, so thank you. Thank you, Julie. Let us join our hearts and minds and share them with God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our Creator, who dwells beyond our imaginations and yet delights to make your home in human hearts, there is no end to the awe and wonder we feel in the face of your magnificent creation. Words cannot convey our gratitude for such an undeserved gift. We praise you for the astonishing beauty that stops us in our tracks wherever we turn. We revere you for the fruitfulness of creation that has gushed forth life and goodness for billions of years. We thank you for the multitude of ways that the natural world sustains and nourishes us in body and spirit. 
we are humbled that we are part of such a display of your glory. Our hearts overflow with love for you revealed in the wonder of creation. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us that we may have the passion and the wisdom to work effectively to restore your creation. Guide us in our personal, church, and community efforts. Give us strength to continue on with this work when it is difficult and requires sacrifice. Bless the earth and all its life in every way that we may, be all, that we may all be fully alive. Give your church, O oh God, fresh vision and a new love, deep wisdom and clear understanding that the eternal message of your grace revealed to us in the life and ministry of Jesus may be powerfully proclaimed as good news for a world that is struggling in deep need. Give us a more powerful dedication to seek justice and peace for all people, a quicker desire to dismantle systemic injustices, to bring an end to the inequities lived out each day by our siblings on the margins, to eliminate hunger and homelessness, suffering of body, mind, or spirit, and above all, to place our complete trust in your revealed desire for healing and wholeness for all of life and each and every one of your uniquely beautiful creations. Deliver us from apathy and complacency. Help us to know that what happens to one happens to all, that we are all interconnected by your spirit of life. Give us the same compassion revealed in Jesus for the underprivileged and suffering. May we extend your love to all our neighbors, especially those who are other than ourselves and our tribes, those we love and hardest for us, those we don't know, dislike, or even our enemies. Compassionate God, we pray for all people who are sick and struggling with illnesses of any kind, including addiction and mental health challenges. We pray that your healing power would surround and support and heal all people. Be with all families that grieve. Draw us all together in networks of strong love and deep compassion that we may support and help each other. Help us to love and care for your precious creation and all of your creations as you love and care for us. Help us to find our eternal joy in your service and hasten the day when your peace and goodness shall fill the earth as we stand together as your beloved children. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is with us. This is the divine promise in which we place our ultimate trust. No matter what kind of day or year we may be having, God is with us. God is leading us. God is holding us with a love that will never let us go. And so we respond with gratitude. Gratitude for God's presence in our lives and for the gifts of grace that sustain us all along our journeys. Rejoicing in the blessings we have received and continue to receive through the amazing generosity of God. We rejoice in gratitude and we respond in joyful discipleship, including the offering of our financial resources so that this congregation and the greater church may carry out the mission and ministry divinely charged to us through God's prophetic word and the life of Jesus. Let us now take the time to give of our own gifts with which God has so richly blessed us you can send your financial gifts and offerings in the mail to the church or electronically. Both addresses are on the screen beside me, or you may drop them in the offering plate as you exit the sanctuary following the worship service. And now trusting in our continued generosity and commitment to the mission of this congregation, 
Let us dedicate our offerings. Let us pray. Eternal and living God, you are our strength and the rock on which we stand. You are our breath and the spirit which calls us to reach beyond ourselves. Transform our offerings for your purposes that they might build and support, heal and inspire, and touch the lives of your children with a grace that can only come from you. Amen. Please stand as you are able and body or spirit as we sing our closing hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth, number 14 in the hymnal. And now go out into the world through the gate of infinite love, out into abundant life. Go out and have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people, all of life. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you do, go with God's blessing. May the grace and love of our divine Father and Mother, the compassion and humility of the Christ embodied in our brother Jesus, and the inspiration and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide in you from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.